Late in the spring of 1960, the George Washington left for Port Canaveral, Florida, to be wedded to the first Polaris missile, the result of a two and a half billion dollar program. Opening the muzzle hatch on tube nine to receive missile. As one of the 16 hatches opened to accept the long tube used to shoehorn the missile down into the Washington, we were suddenly reminded of how many technological revolutions were involved here. As late as 1945, Fleet Admiral Leahy said an atomic bomb could never be built. In 1949, Vannevar Bush predicted that a long-range ballistic missile was completely unfeasible. Robert Oppenheimer was skeptical about the hydrogen bomb and was convinced that if one could be built, it would be too heavy and unwieldy to be used in war. A whole covey of admirals were opposed to the nuclear submarine, and as recently as February 1960, the Air Force and its champion, Senator Stuart Symington, challenged the wisdom of betting so heavily on Polaris rather than the B-70. These breakthroughs were now combined in a single experiment, small enough to be contained beneath one of those hatches. In what is called Sherwood Forest, where 16 Polaris will eventually be stored, we talked with Admiral Rayburn. Admiral Rayburn, exactly where are we now? Well, we're in the middle of the ship. These are, these are our missile tubes, and uh, they have two rows here, um, eight on this side, eight on the other. And uh, uh, you might say the heart of the weapon system is here. Rather a lethal forest, isn't it? It certainly is. <laughs> Admiral, you have a very considerable course record in this whole operation, not only the Polaris, but the submarine as well. How do you cut through the red tape? How, how do you get things done? This has been a most, uh, most wonderful experience for us uh, that's been engaged in this, and it's principally because of the, uh, of the way we've been allowed to do this. There may be a, a very conservative uh, uh, in, uh, outfit, of course. So I've heard. <laughs> took, uh, took a deep breath and uh, said, let's, let's really do this one upright. And uh, the, the way we have made progress is because we started out without having any preconceived um, or, or tradition or uh, this is, don't ask me any questions why we do it, we just do things this way. This, none of this entered into it. Actually, we were given a complete free reign to, to generate the type of organization to do this job and we're given complete authority and responsibility. Well, how much does one of these ships cost? Well, it's a very expensive item. It's the most expensive item of our entire weapon system. But fortunately, it's the most, uh, it's the longest lived. Now this first stage missile, uh, because it is so very versatile, is expensive. It's even recallable. And I think hardly any other first stage of a missile can, you can make that boast. It's an intelligent first stage. The uh, cost of this submarine, uh, it runs about $100 million complete. This is, a, this is expensive, but its useful life is 15 to 20 years. You can amortize the cost of this over that time, and it isn't so costly. Then you can always put new missiles, more exciting, more higher performing missiles in these tubes. And as far as the effect on the target is concerned, is oh, this was the latest thing that just off the assembly line. Uh, Admiral, I'd like to get this matter of cost straight. You say that the submarine itself costs about a hundred million, right? Yes, yes, sir. And the cost of the missile? It'll run slightly over a million. Slightly over a million each per, per copy? Yes, sir. Admiral, do you expect that newer or more exotic fuels will give you more than a 1,500 mile range? Oh, yes. We, being, as I say, having long experience in this field, uh, fully see that we can get, um, in the very near future, a 1,500 mile missile. The first one, of course, will be 1,200 miles. And we also see our way uh, distinctly clear to go right up to a 2,500-mile missile. It'll fit right in these tubes. So that uh, it's sort of like a gun. You have a gun, you put a higher-performing cartridge in it, and you shoot a little further, a little more accurate, and so on. Uh, let's talk a moment about the uh, missile system. There are 16 of them here. Uh, what if one failed? What if one hangs in the rack, in the old phrase? <clears throat> well, uh, it, we have um, automatic checkout equipment, which uh, tells us if the missile is ready to go and tells us if the launching equipment is ready to go. And after the missile has its information as to where it's going and where, it's, where it is, uh, then it's all ready to go. And if you get the green lights on all your, in your checkout boards, you push a button and it's going to go. Uh, if something happens, if it's not quite ready to go in one aspect or another, you merely bypass that one and, and take the next one that's ready to go. 
Now, you used a very interesting phrase there. If the submarine knows where it is and the missile knows where it is, let's assume you've been submerged for uh, three weeks. You haven't looked at the stars. You indicated, one, that the submarine must know where it is, and also the missile must know where it is. How do they know where it is? <laughs> well, that's a good question, and it's one which is, I'm sure, well-meaning friends all over the country have been somewhat skeptical about our ability to do this. I must admit, when we started out, that uh, this looked like a pretty sizable job. The heart of the navigational system is, is a ship's inertial navigational device or system. It's called SINS, S-I-N-S. This has appeared many times in the print. Yeah. Uh, it's a device which I believe most people give credit to Dr. St uh, Stark Draper of, of the Instrumentation Laboratory at MIT. Now, this is an inertial guidance system, if you please, of long duration. It properly set from a known place, in which you do before you go to sea. It tells you where you, where you are. It, it senses motions. It has its own gyros and accelerometers, and it senses motion. It, it tracks you, if you please. And so, uh, at any time, with reference to this, you know where you are. Well, sir, once the submarine knows, how does the missile know? Well, <laughs> this course is done by, uh, by means of some ingenious devices of, of transferring the knowledge from the SENS to the missile guidance system, the brain of the missile, and says, oh boy, you're here. Now, when you take off, we want you to go over there. And here, here again, we have another inertial guidance system, very, like, very much like the SENS, which senses the, the flight of the missile through the air. It knows where the missile is going, and, and because we have preset into it where it should be going, it compares the inserted correct path with what the missile is actually doing, and it gives it the necessary commands to get back on the correct path. But when Admiral Rayburn said that, no Polaris had in fact been fired from a submarine. Frequently in the past, our missiles and rockets have failed to fly on their target date. Indeed, some of them have been more than a year late. But as far back as November of 1958, Admiral Rayburn said that George Washington would fire a Polaris while submerged by August of 1960. And in January of this year, he went so far as to schedule the shoot for July 18th. But there was another target date just 11 days before this could happen. And that called for a final full grain shot from the ship simulator on the observation island at sea. The Polaris exited from the launch tube as planned, ignited as it was supposed to, and even appeared to begin its flight as programmed. Then it went sour. All of this so near the critical shot date gave some people a turn, but not Admiral Rayburn who said at the time, we've been building automobiles for 50, 75 years, and every now and then you turn out one that's not so good. Uh, we've been uh, building missiles for conservative less time, and uh, we're doing advanced testing now, and uh, we expect to have some of our advanced models to come a cropper. Four out of six tests from the observation aisle had been successful, and Rayburn decided to keep his Monday date at sea. Now is the fateful Monday, July 18, 1960. What was to have happened for the first time in 1963 is about to be attempted in the Gulf Stream, 30 miles off Canaveral. The George Washington, with its blue and gold crews, together with a variety of technical experts, carried on this occasion a company of nearly 300, almost three times its usual complement. Nearby, the observation island, Loaded with more experts and massive amounts of monitoring and tracking devices, sails a parallel course. At 12.30, the George Washington, with Admiral Rayburn aboard, but still under command of Skipper Jim Osborne, throttles down its engine to a speed sufficient only to hold the ship against the current and assumes launch depth. Under combat conditions, no part of the structure would be visible. The antenna, you see, is a special device for radar tracking during tests only. At 1.30 p.m., the final countdown begins. Uh, nickname, Mobilize Lima. Confirm that you have no further need for command carrier. Over. Mobilize Lima. Mobilize Lima. This is nickname. Nickname. Mobilize Lima, Roger out. 
Miss firing. This button does not launch the missile. It is the commander's authorization to fire when ready, Gridley. Weapons launcher, tube number nine is pressurized. Opening the muzzle hatch on tube nine. The weapons, this is launcher. Tube number nine, muzzle hatch locked open. That time is T minus 50 seconds. All the way, Lima, Roger out. Green smoke away. The smoke signal has nothing to do with the Polaris system. Is here today only to help mark the experiment for surface observers. Mobilize Lima, mobilize Lima. This is nickname, uh, nickname. On the mark, T minus 30 and counting. Nine, eight, seven, six, five. Okay. Three, two, one, mark. T minus 30 seconds. T minus 30 seconds. T minus 25 seconds and counting. T minus two zero seconds. Stand by, stand by, stand by, stand by, stand by, stand by, stand by. Ten. Ten seconds. Eight. Seven. Six. Five. Five seconds. Oh. Wait, one. Damn it! Hold, hold, hold! No umbilical retract. Bypass, no umbilical retract. Wait, one. The umbilical is the final link in the electronic contact between the submarine system and the missile. And as you heard, something went wrong in the final seconds. He counted down to one second and stopped for daddy goes hey, or something. Three more times that afternoon, Rayburn gave the order to try again. And three times the countdown was aborted in the final minutes. Finally, at 7.45, a tired and somewhat discouraged crew heard this. Now hear this. The George Washington will not fire today. The George Washington will not fire today. The George Washington did not fire. The George Washington and the observation aisle returned to port. The reporters on the observation aisle were asked politely not to report the failure, pending another attempt to launch. It was never reported. On Wednesday, July 20th, the observation aisle and the George Washington put to sea again. On my mark, T minus 30 seconds. Six, five, four, three, two, one. 30 seconds. Minus 30 seconds. Don't go, Admiral. Missile men have learned to live with failure. But a malfunction this time, coming after the blow-up of the Observation Island launch the previous week and the discouragement of two days before, would hurt badly. first separation, which means the first motor, the first container of solid fuel, has burned itself out, and an explosive bolt will separate it from the second stage. Separation! Good separation. Good, Good separation, Pat. We just got second stage ignition. The instrumentation indicates. No much good. On trajectory. Right, let's take a pickle barrel, too. one and a half. Still looks good. The next thing to watch for is the cutoff. That means that the second stage has gotten the warhead out of the Earth's atmosphere, has kicked the warhead, which in war would be a hydrogen bomb, into the proper trajectory, 
and can now separate and fall away. Look good. Good luck. Good work. Right. There you are, Admiral. Admiral, you want to see there? There you are. Now, this is Admiral Raven talking. I, I would like to most sincerely congratulate uh, your fine skipper, Captain Osman, and every member of this crew on what is, in my opinion, the most significant, <laughs> significant happening since the day that the airplane flew and certainly the day that it flew off of a ship of the Navy. You may not realize this now, but, and the world may not realize it, but deep in our hearts, those of us who know the most about it, and that's certainly you, we have given to our country the pre preeminent weapon for her defense that has been brought down the road of inventions for over two decades. They're complimentary. They're a wonderful gang, and I know you're going to serve your country uh, in a splendid fashion. They're mighty proud of you. Two hours later, to make up for the Monday disappointment, Rayburn fired a second Polaris. This was away at 3.32, and was another perfect shoot. As it lifted itself toward its Caribbean target by way of the vacuum of space, one is suddenly aware that in combat, that button would be pushed 16 times, and 16 hydrogen warheads could be fired in 15 minutes, putting all of them in space before the first reaches its target. As the George Washington turned back to Canaveral, a sailor hoisted an old-fashioned broom on the periscope, which by Navy tradition means a clean sweep. Later, we talked with Admiral Arleigh Burke about the larger meaning of this day's work. Admiral, is Polaris the ultimate weapon? No, there is, there is no such thing as an absolute weapon. How vulnerable to detection is this ship? It's not very vulnerable. The, the reason for that is that this ship is for a, the purpose of being on station to fire its missiles. It's not searching for uh, enemy ships or enemy submarines. It is avoiding enemy ships and enemy submarines. It will steam at low speed. It will use various types of cover. It ca it's, does not have to expose itself at all. It's very invulnerable. Admiral Burke, you fired several of these missiles, but most of them have been fired near Cape Canaveral, where the range safety officer could destruct them if they went off course. But what if one should be fired later on from out in the ocean and suddenly take off in the direction of Chicago instead of, say, Moscow? Could it be destructive? Well, no, uh, no, he can't destruct it, but it doesn't, uh, none of these missiles have ever gone in the wrong direction. And I think that that danger is, is very, very remote, so remote that it's, that it's negligible. Uh, the Air Force has a fail-safe device, which they contend will prevent any bomber taking off and dropping its bombs without complete authorization. You don't have a fail-safe device, do you? Well, that's uh, as far as a missile is concerned, but we have the fail-safe system if you'd like to call it that, in the submarine itself. We're not under any pressure to get off our missiles because if we don't get them off, they will be destroyed. Uh, in addition to that, the first stage of this ICBM, which is in this uh, submarine, is the submarine itself. That's, uh, it's, part, it's largely, it's already covered most of the distance. So uh, we, we wait until we are sure then tell the commander, fire, and he fires. Admiral, never in the history of armed force will a man have put to sea with so much power, so far from his base, so far from the source of command. What about the possibility of mutiny, madness, or a mistake? Oh, we've thought of those, that we have a, a wild captain, that, uh, some, that something happens, and we ha and so the executive officer checks the captain so that both of them uh, would have to go crazy at the same time, and that's never occurred. <laughs> uh, uh, what about faulty communication? Well, it, it doesn't matter whether the... We have good communications now. We have very many different methods of communicating with the submarine, both normal methods and unusual methods. But even if there were no communications whatever, uh, that we had directly with the submarine. Still, the submarine would be uh, 
in a position to fire, it would be in no danger, it's in no hurry, it doesn't have to get its missiles off in a hurry, so it, will, it can wait, it can uh, get the, the data from the world's uh, radios. All the world, if anything happens, will be talking about it over the radio. There will be a lot of news, and he will know what's happening then, and then he can come up and ask. He can ask Washington. He gets no answer from Washington. He asks all the other radio stations, the naval radio stations in the world. Some of them will be there. Uh, Admiral, it has been contended that these Polaris missiles are good city busters, but not very useful against hardened bases. Uh, they're quite accurate. They're, they're extremely accurate, and uh, they will destroy any target that we want destroyed. What happens if NATO nations decide to adopt Polaris? be a good thing. Uh, it, would be, uh, it would be perfectly all right. Uh, now, it depends, of course, upon whether they develop their own warheads or not. As you know, the AEC, our laws require that we cannot release to anybody the warheads which we build. So, but we have uh, procedures by which the warheads are under the custody of United States people. And uh, the same sort of a procedure could be used for these Polaris submarines if some of the other nations do want to build them. Admiral Burke, I know you're reluctant to discuss politics, but doesn't this Polaris submarine make us less liable to blackmail by our allies who in turn may be being blackmailed or threatened by the Russians? Uh, that, the word blackmail perhaps is a little, is a little uh, too strong. Less dependent upon our allies, certainly. Uh, we are not dependent upon our allies uh, solely for this. We can use this uh, with, with our allies' uh, approval, or, we, or if, there are, if the situation should come, this can be used. We're, we're, it's not on their territory. It's not fired from their territory. It's fired from the high seas. So uh, they need not fear Russia the pressure on them for them to uh, prevent us from uh, using their soil. Then this can be used as a military instrument without reference to political considerations. That is correct, and that is a very valuable adjunct to this missile. That's, that's a better definition than my use of black veil. Admiral, do we have any overseas bases that are secure or reliable for a prolonged period of time? Well, you know, there's probably nothing fixed in a fixed location, any place in the world that is very secure, or will be very secure in the next three or four years at least. This is either by uh, long-range missiles or short-range missiles, depending upon where it is. So there is no known fixed location, any place in the world that cannot be destroyed. Hence, bases are becoming more and more vulnerable because they're fixed and they're known. Ten Polaris missiles have been launched from underwater. Four have been failures, due to special technical and safety devices used in test firing. You may never read or hear that the George Washington is operational. She and the Patrick Henry will continue their seat tests, and one day they will go out and just stay out, on station, submerged, fully armed with 16 missiles, each submarine carrying more destructive power then was dropped by all bombers flown by all the nations engaged in World War II. By December, the Robert E. Lee will be firing its first test birds. Then the Theodore Roosevelt, to be followed by the Abraham Lincoln, the Ethan Allen, and the Thomas Edison. By the end of 1961, there should be six submarines on station. There is money appropriated now for 19. The Navy says we need 45 for a global Polaris system. Polaris is not the ultimate weapon, for there is no such thing. Each weapon in due course produces a counterweapon. What Polaris has done is to buy us a certain amount of time, time in which to try to solve the great problem of our age. And that problem is to determine the conditions, if any, upon which the communist world and the free world are willing to live together on this minor planet. Polaris does not solve that problem. Polaris was designed to deter aggression. It is clear warning to any enemy that if he reckons to destroy our missile launching sites and our bomber bases and those of our allies by surprise attack and succeeds in doing it, then there will remain off his coast those hidden, swift, silent, 
underwater launching pads, ready and able to destroy him. That's what the military men call second strike capability. Polaris reduces our reliance upon foreign bases. It may tempt some to return to a fortress America attitude, but it provides nothing in the way of national life insurance. Polaris is the result of accelerated technology. It may be impossible to apply that same technique to matters having to do with human will, passion, and prejudice. But Polaris gives the statesman an opportunity to continue trying. The question is, what shall we do with the time Polaris has bought us? Polaris means power, deterrent power. Destruction is its final, ultimate, desperate purpose. If it is ever combat fired, it will have failed its purpose. And our civilization will have failed its promise. Good night and good luck. <laughs>